So please join me in welcoming her to Texas Food District. <laughs> Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Thank you so much for that great introduction, John. Um, that's you know one of the most sympathetic introductions I've had so far of all the talks I've given. Um, he's really entered into the spirit of the book already. Um, I, and it's great also to see so many people who are from the suburbs at some point in their life here as well. Um, I live in the suburbs. Um, but before I lived in the suburbs, I lived in Baltimore, and I still really miss it. I live in Silver Spring now, so it's really like probably the most, I, I was probably the most excited to come here to Red Emma's uh, of any talk I've given for this book. So thank you so much for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Um, so yeah, the suburbs, you know, the malls, uh, really stultifying, really boring, right? Um, I thought kind of, to get us in, in and out of that mindset, we could kind of start by reviewing um, that suburban kind of ideal that was um, sort of that canonical image of the suburbs that you saw in advertisements and television in you know the 1950s and 60s. Leave it to Beaver, the Bradys, uh, very much the kind of white upper middle class happy, um, uh, you know, comfortable family living in uh, a single family home, uh, you know, in a, a kind of manicured, uh, regulated environment, right? That's kind of the image of the suburbs that I think we still see so much in popular media and that people kind of bristle against, right? And react against like, oh, get me out of here. Um, but it's really interesting because when the, um, the kind of track suburbs were built after the Second World War, you had a lot of entertainment and advertising kind of promoting this norm, right? This cultural norm uh, and kind of uh, aspirational ideal, uh, you know, right on through probably the 80s and 90s. Um, but almost immediately after those suburbs were built, you also had this kind of, um, uh, you know, cultural um, kind of push to explore the dark side of the suburbs. Uh-oh, another flash flood warning, I guess. Um, so uh, there was this kind of dark suburbia kind of, you know, cultural um, exploration as well. And that I'm sure uh, people are also familiar with. <laughs> and that also has had its own kind of long and rich history in, in, uh, in popular culture. Um, and this was, again, uh, people reacting against what they saw as the conformity of, uh, of the environment and also of um, the moral and kind of social expectations, this idea that uh, it was just living in, um, you know, the little boxes on the hillside that are ticky tacky and all just the same uh, as the song goes. Um, the Stepford Wives, I'm sure some people here have seen that movie and this idea that it kind of, um, the environment almost turns you into a drone. You have no agency left. And then um, probably my favorite example and the most recent would be the movie Get Out, which I think kind of mines some of that same vein. So I guess I got started on my weird path into the <laughs> recesses of suburbia, you know, because I have lived in the suburbs now uh, for 13 years and sort of ended up there, I wouldn't say reluctantly exactly, but because it was the most, it was like the compromise place. I was commuting from Baltimore to DC. It was just way too long once I had a baby and was adding like a daycare, you know, drop off into that. I was spending three and a half hours a day commuting and I thought I can't do this anymore. And I couldn't really afford to live in the city. And then, well, you know, what do you do? You move to the suburbs. And so I kind of moved there and thought this is, this is the place that works, as I think a lot of people think when maybe when they move to suburbia. But uh, you know, my neighborhood was really interesting um, because I moved into this uh, condo that had been built in this um, brick townhouse from uh, built during World War II, actually, built as defense housing. And um, you know, my neighbors, I had neighbors from, uh, from Kenya, from Brazil, 
uh, from Cincinnati, <laughs> right? So people from, uh, from everywhere. And it was a, a predominantly uh, Central American neighborhood. And so you could walk to all sorts of stuff. And then, you know, people were taking the bus. And, uh, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like really urban in the sense that it was still very suburban looking. It was big garden apartments and um, wide roads. And so I thought, this is never, uh, this is not a type of landscape you really see people kind of acknowledge as suburban. Or, you know, you really see, uh, and there are a lot of suburbs like that, I think, especially around DC, but really all around the country that do not kind of conform to um, uh, you know, the archetype. And, and I thought, that's, that's interesting. Why, you know, why aren't these kind of commonly acknowledged? And so I started to read about the history of suburbs and realized it was a lot more interesting and diverse than I had expected. Um, you know, before World War II, I think if you're familiar with the kind of earlier suburbs before the Second World War, before cars too, or, or before everybody had a car, um, you might think of places like, well, here in Baltimore, I guess it's within city limits, but Roland Park would be a kind of classic example. Um, uh, in the Midwest, Shaker Heights, Ohio, um, even Beverly Hills in California, that these were you know, quite high-end kind of enclaves uh, for wealthy people, they often had um, uh, you know, deed restrictions basically saying that people who were not white could, could not live there, or you know, people who were black or, or Jewish. Um, so you know, those were, um, there was a whole generation or a couple of generations of suburbs like that. But what I kind of didn't realize was uh, you know, simultaneously, there were all sorts of these other settlements that um, some of them weren't even you know, really incorporated. They were like informal settlements um, of, you know, where people would just kind of go and, and buy, buy lots outside of the city and maybe, you know, keep animals. Um, and uh, they're kind of these scruffy suburbs, right? So I became interested. I was reading about some of these. And I mean, there's a couple of examples here. Um, this uh, photograph is of somebody just selling lots outside of Detroit. This was in the 1940s. You know, and sometimes people would buy lots. Sometimes they would have like water and sewage service, but sometimes they wouldn't. You know, and they would, you know, it would just be like totally unimproved. Um, and people would build their own houses. Sometimes they would build them from a kit, or you know, uh, sometimes not if they knew somebody who was a carpenter who would help them out. So there was definitely this tradition of kind of, you know, make do self building. Um, and you know there were also uh, quite a number of industrial suburbs. Um, this uh, illustration I just I always find so compelling when I look at it. Um, this was uh, a sort of shanty town essentially on the outskirts of Toronto, and it was uh, inhabited by mainly immigrants from Great Britain who had moved to Canada, uh, you know, in in search of work. And there were factories uh, at that time that were kind of rapidly expanding in that area. And so um, really the workers in these new factories lived in these uh, you know, kind of shanty towns. And of course, Canadian winter, uh, the conditions were extremely harsh. And uh, you know, they were really, um, this was, I think, uh, from a Toronto newspaper. And you know, people were uh, worried, the better kind of, the better class of citizen, they were worried about the people living in in the shanty towns, and so you can see this man, as his family looks on inside, he's battling a wrestling with a wolf uh, that has starvation written on it. So I mean, people were—it um, was a pretty hard scrabble existence. It was—it was tough there. So then, you know, I, at the same time, I was kind of starting to look at the history of communes and what you might call—not quite communes, but like nonconformist communities on the urban fringes. Um, and you know, definitely starting in about the 1820s, but really in the mid 19th century, all the way through about 1910 or even 1920, uh, you had this kind of these waves of people uh, founding experimental communities. Um, there were, I think, something like I think something like 200 different communes uh, in that period founded, and a lot of them, when we think about people. Um, 
you know, striking out to have found, uh, to start a commune, we usually think about them doing it really in the wilderness, right? And maybe trying to be self-sufficient. But what, and there were a lot of people doing that. But what I found interesting was, you know, there, there was a, a reasonable number of people who didn't go that far. <laughs> And, you know, maybe they found a great spot that was, you know, 10 or like 20 miles from the city and thought, okay, this will be good. The land was still a lot cheaper out there. So if you were just looking for enough land, you know, to, to build houses and maybe to manufacture something and, um, uh, and to grow some food, maybe not to be self-sufficient, um, you could find a good spot. So a couple of examples uh, here. I mentioned Shaker Heights already, and it's named for the Shakers, and the Shakers actually had a community. Uh, this is really close to Cleveland, um, just a, a couple of miles, I think, over the, over the Cleveland line uh, to the east. Um, but so Shaker Heights actually was a suburb that followed an earlier uh, Shaker community on that same site. Um, the Raritan Bay Union in uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, uh, is uh, an interesting example of a uh, Fourierite uh, settlement, uh, a phalanstery, I'm probably not saying it uh, with the appropriate French accent, um, but this was a, a kind of strand of uh, utopian socialism uh, founded by uh, Charles Fourier, uh, who thought that he had kind of um, the perfect system of living where everybody uh, would live, I think it was uh, several hundred people or maybe a thousand would live in this one large building called a phalanx. And so you can see in this, uh, in the drawing at the bottom, that that is the one large building that they had built. I don't think it was, I'm not sure it was ever fully, uh, fully occupied. Um, but uh, I mean, this, there were a number of these uh, for your right communities, uh, I think even in, just in New Jersey, but around the country. There was even one, I think, outside of Dallas. So, um, and then a, a kind of a personal favorite of mine is in Delaware. It's called Arden. And this was a Georgist suburb. So this was founded on the principles of Henry George. Um, Henry George was the, the single taxer, the land tax guy. Um, I, won't go into too much detail, but um, really he, he believed strongly that land should be a public resource, that uh, people who kind of made money uh, off of land, because land, you know, especially land in a good location because that's scarce, that this was, um, uh, you know, this, it was not appropriate to make money off of that because, you know, you weren't doing anything. It's, you know, if you, were, if you put a factory on the land and decided to manufacture something of value, that's okay, but if you're just, uh, you know, if you're just charging rent, um, you know, he thought this this was immoral, and that uh, the, the land should sort of um, uh, really the, the benefit of the land should belong to anyone. And he proposed uh, a, a, a tax on the value of land so that uh, you know you could share that value, of what he called the unearned increment. So, uh, Georgism was a really big deal. Uh, in the late 19th and uh, very early years of the 20th century. And uh, Arden was founded, the idea was um, that people would kind of pay a land tax instead of regular property tax. It hasn't quite worked like that, but they, they've, they've come up with their own system and they, that kind of approximates it, and they still use it. And so it's still there. Um, there are all these buildings built in the arts and crafts style. Um, they have a little... Um, they have like a little civic hall there and an outdoor amphitheater where they, for years, staged uh, uh, Shakespeare plays in the summer. I'm, I'm not sure if they still do, but um, you meet a lot of interesting people when you're researching a book. And probably one of my favorite people I met was uh, this gentleman named Mike Curtis. Uh, Mike is a lifelong resident of Arden, Delaware. Uh, he is a very committed Georgist. And he, it's in his, Georgism is in his blood. His grandfather was a member of Henry George's inner circle and actually was there, I think, at George's deathbed. Uh, so he is a, a real dyed-in-the-wool Georgist, and he goes around town in, in his old Ford. I'm not sure what model that is, a Model A. Uh, I think it might be a Model A. But he took me, he took me for a ride. It was, uh, it was slow, but very fun. 
Uh, so yeah, he's one of my one of my favorite radical suburbanites. Um, and I think like like all good uh, good radicals, I think he's fallen out with like you know a lot of the organizations in his space. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure, but funny guy. So now I'll tell you a little bit about the communities that I focused on in the book. So the first one, it's called Old Economy now. I mean, the historic site is called Old Economy. But the name of the place in its day was Economy, Pennsylvania. It's about 12 or so miles uh, outside of Pittsburgh, um, just, I guess, northwest of Pittsburgh. Um, and if you go there now, there is the state historic site. Um, but the town was founded in 1824 by a German religious sect called the, uh, the Harmonists. And they had come over from Germany um, after uh, a break with the, you know, the Lutheran uh, orthodoxy. Uh, they were persecuted. Um, their leader was a dissident preacher named George Rapp. So they were also sometimes called the Rappists or the Rappites. Um, so originally they had about 3,000 acres of farmland and vineyards and orchards around uh, a village. And today the historic site is just kind of the center of that village. Um, and they called it economy not uh, because of like industriousness or thrift, but it, it was to signify a concept of divine economy kind of sense of well-managed order bent to holy purposes. Um, and the, the very, the kind of, uh, the, the gridded plan of the town that had the church and uh, the religious leaders home at the middle kind of expressed this sense of, of divine order uh, and kind of being, uh, being orderly and uh, uh, before God. Um, so the town had uh, about, a hundred or so houses, just like the one seen here. Um, a pretty simple two-story brick structure, nothing exceptional. What's interesting about the Harmonists is how they lived in these houses. Um, they would have often between six or eight adults sharing a house like that. Uh, sometimes it would be married couples, but sometimes it would be a married couple and maybe a brother and sister or uh, you know, unrelated, unmarried adults. Um, and this was because they were celibate. <laughs> so they did not, uh, it was not a, a society based around the nuclear family because they did not have nuclear families. Uh, there had been a religious revival shortly after they came over from Germany where uh, they, they had not originally been celibate where they suddenly said, you know, to be perfect before God, we got to do this. We got to give up sex. So, uh, so they did that. Um, and what I find so interesting about that is that, it, in a way, it's, it sort of looks forward to you know, co-living or co-housing arrangements. Um, and also the fact that this was a suburb you know, in such contrast to the post-war suburb where it was all about the nuclear family and the children and the right environment for kids. This was a suburb that there were some kids around. They had them working in the factories. but. Um, you know, this was a suburb where children were, uh, uh, there were not many children and they were really of a, you know, very secondary concern. So um, I think that, you know, example does have some relevance today when the population of the United States, but especially of a lot of suburban areas is aging. Um, and, uh, you know, living together in these houses, I think, uh, gave people, um, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of help as they grew older. Um, so, you know, they were a pretty religious group of people. Uh, economy was not a place where you would live if you were fickle or lighthearted. Um, but, you know, they were also, I think their social system was kind of radical. Um, there was no private property. So when you wanted to join their group, there was actually a legal agreement that you signed where you said, I am acknowledging I give up everything I have, everything I, I own, I am giving to the society uh, for the, the good of the society. But, and in exchange, they actually made you a promise in exchange. They said, okay, as long as you work, you know, as long as you work hard, uh, you will be provided with shelter, 
food, clothing. Uh, I'm not sure if it was in the contract, but medical care. They had a very good doctor who lived in the town. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, the entire society to help you if you were sick or uh, ailing. Um, so, uh, you know, people, it, it was, I think people saw it as a good exchange. And they actually, I think, sometimes had people trying to join who were turned away, who <laughs> said, no, sorry, no, this, this isn't right for you or you're not right for us. So, um, so they practiced this collectivism with a good success for decades. Their factories were extremely prosperous. Um, they made all sorts of things. They made uh, uh, silks. They, um, I think, other fabrics, uh, wool, woolens, um, and uh, even wine and beer. Um, and they also had great, uh, some success as a kind of tourist locale because people were curious about them. And they would come up on the, uh, once the train came in, they would come on the train and kind of, you know, want to spend the day there looking around. And they had a hotel and a, with a big dining room. So they were, um, they were quite, quite prosperous. And being close to the city was important uh, for them because they needed to be close to that market for their goods. And also, I think, um, to be close to their various uh, business agents and, uh, you know, for, the, you know, in terms of the tourism, I don't think that would have been possible if they had not been on the train line or if they had been much farther away from Pittsburgh. Um, so, you know, when people would come, they were often really impressed by, you know, how sanitary the town was, the fact that people lived to a ripe old age, um, you know, the, the standard of, uh, of medical care uh, provided and the fact that they had things like a um, they had their own band, they played music and uh, choir. Um, women learned to read and uh, worked outside the home. And since, uh, as some, some scholars have pointed out, since nobody actually received cash payment for their work, women were paid at the same rate as men were. So, uh, I mean, you know, everybody got their, their same allotment, right? And, uh, you know, women as well as men. However, it was not democratic socialism. Uh, George Rapp was kind of a theocrat. Uh, he made a lot of the big decisions of the group. He also lived in a much larger and luxurious house than regular members did. And um, he, uh, he stockpiled uh, you know, gold in a safe in his house as well. But his claim was he was waiting until uh, you know, he had to save it up for when they were going to go back to the New Jerusalem. Um, and so, but you know, people would, journalists and writers would come to economy and write about it, uh, you know, very admiringly, like, gosh, you know, this is a handsome town, it's so orderly, people seem happy, and they're well fed, and, um, and, and they're making so much money in these factories. And, uh, you know, especially because they were German speakers, especially people uh, in Germany had heard about economy and about the harmonists. Uh, and one person who highlighted the success of the harmonists with some excitement was Friedrich Engels, who in an essay in the 1840s said, economy was proof that communism was not just nice in theory, but possible and desirable in practice. And looking at, harmoni har at the harmonists and some other examples uh, in America, he said, the Americans are tired of continuing as the slaves of the few rich men who feed on the labor of the people. It's obvious that with the great energy and endurance of this nation, community of goods will soon be introduced over a significant part of the country. Well, that did not happen. Uh, private property became more firmly entrenched in the United States. But this experiment outside of Pittsburgh was one small seed of the revolution that would later sweep through other parts of the world. I think is a very interesting thing to contemplate the role of this proto suburb, <laughs> small as it was uh, in larger revolutions. So this is going to be the part I think that John appreciates the most. He was talking about being from Edison and learning about this unusual community near him. And that, well, well there are actually two, but the one that I write about is uh, the Stelton Colony. It's in what is now Piscataway, New Jersey, very close to Edison, a couple of miles, I think. Um, and it just has the most fascinating story. So it all actually started in Manhattan. Uh, 
where there was uh, a, a group called the Ferrer Center, uh, which was an anarchist association. It was named for the Catalonian anarchist and educator Francisco Ferrer, uh, who was executed by the Spanish authorities in 1909. Emma Goldman was a guiding force behind this center, and it hosted a lot of uh, you know, classes and lectures. People like Clarence Darrow would come to speak. Um, I think it also hosted uh, uh, you know, just English language classes for recent immigrants and uh, things like that. Um, and in 1911, they decided to open their own school for children. And this was a school for working class children. It was, uh, first it was on the Lower East Side, and then it moved up to Harlem. So they were running this school pretty, pretty nicely. It was small, but you know, with some success. Um, and then in 1914, a bomb exploded in a tenement on Lexington Avenue, killing the four young people who had been planning to use it. There's some uh, speculation that the bomb was intended for John D. Rockefeller. And uh, when the police looked into it, three of the bombers turned out to be regulars at the association. So uh, scrutiny of the association intensified. Uh, police started to infiltrate their meetings. And the leaders of the center were really worried about um, uh, you know, about the effect of, uh, you know, uh, of being spied on, but also above, about the, um, the kind of, really the real militants in their group and kind of poisoning the atmosphere for the children. They were realizing that having, uh, uh, you know, really militant revolutionaries, uh, you know, mixing with the kids and, you know, with people who were interested in progressive education, that these were probably not totally compatible goals. So, um, so the association purchased this tract of land in New Jersey uh, for $100 an acre, and they decided to move on out. So um, in 1915, uh, I think a few dozen people moved out there, and all there was was um, a, a kind of ramshackle farmhouse. I think the ceiling had fallen in like the night before. <laughs> and um, they kind of had to camp out that winter uh, under really hard conditions, but you know, slowly they fixed things up. They started to build uh, houses, really shacks for themselves, uh, and kind of lay out roads and uh, you know, bring in a water supply. Um, it was it was pretty hard going at first, and um, for the school, a lot of the you know, they went through something like four principals in the first couple of years because nobody. You know, people would be like, I'm out of here after a few months. But, you know, things started to stabilize uh, after a few years. And really, by the 1920s, the colony was, was flourishing and, and had, you know, a few hundred residents, um, co-ops. But it really revolved around the school, um, which, uh, and the school was important not just because people wanted a certain type of good education for their children, but it was... Um, you know the leaders, uh, you know, of the of the association and of the center thought that education really could free the young from fear and dogma, and that this was uh, this was a path to, uh, you know, a more uh, a better future and a, a more enlightened society. Um, but it followed a theory of education that is probably similar to today's kind of unschooling movement, if you're at all familiar with that. It was really self-directed. Um, kids never had to go to class if they didn't want to. Um, school didn't really begin or end. Uh, you know, life in the colony was school, and the school was life, and everything kind of merged seamlessly together. Um, this photo here uh, is a staff a staff photo taken on uh, on the steps of the school building, and actually I, the photo next to it is them uh, them building. The school building. They didn't, I think initially they were just working out of the firm house. But. So what I find so interesting, I mean, of the many things I find so interesting about Stilton, one of them is that, uh, I mean, it really was, uh, despite being probably very rural looking and in what was then a very rural location, it really was suburban in how closely tethered it was still to New York City. So, um, you know, people probably about 30 or 40 percent of residents, according to people I've talked to who grew up there, 
uh, you know, continued to commute to New York uh, so they could get uh, that there was a train station about two miles away. Some people walked. Uh, there was, for a time, there was actually a cooperative bus that would take people, um, like a little jitney to, to the station. Some people rode motorcycles or bikes. Um, but people would get themselves to the station and take the early train into New York. Uh, a number of them worked in the garment district. Um, you know, some of them worked elsewhere in the city. And then also, uh, there were a whole bunch of people who did not commute into war, uh, to New York regularly or, or not every day. But, you know, they would maybe, um, uh, you know, produce, make some clothing or make some garments uh, on site. Or even, um, you know, some people were chicken farmers and they would take their, uh, collect their eggs. And then maybe once or twice a week, they would go into the city and, uh, and sell their eggs in the city. Um, so people really relied on that connection back to the city. I think it was also important for the school because a number of the children were actually not from within the colony, they were boarders. Their parents sent them to board. And, you know, obviously that was a way they could, their kids could get to the school and they could easily go visit them from either New York or, or Philadelphia. So, um, so it was very suburban in that respect. Um, and then, you know, as New Brunswick uh, and other parts of uh, New, New Brunswick sprouted its own suburbs and that whole part of New Jersey started to suburbanize, um, you know, people started to work in New Brunswick or set up their own businesses. So they were really part of a, a larger kind of a pattern of suburbanization. And if you go there today, uh, it, it's really uh, worth, if you're ever in that part of New Jersey, I would recommend, especially you, John, <laughs> I would definitely recommend just driving around. Uh, you, can, you can find um, School Street, named after the school. It's still there. I think it's still called that. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of ranch houses and later later suburban development. It's kind of engulfed what was the colony. But you know, you can very easily make out the little cottages that the colonists built. And in some cases, uh, they've been added onto. I love this example up here because it's like the little the little anarchist shack with this big addition right next to it, kind of looming over it. Um, there are uh, other kind of more haphazard, uh, you know, renovations that you can see where there's kind of one room been, that's been put on kind of three sides of the original, the original uh, cottage. And, but you can very easily make them out and kind of say, oh, that was, that was an original colony building, or original Stelton building. And uh, the quite extraordinary uh, cottage uh, here, the Goldman House is probably the most recognizable uh, that's there today, well, then and now. Um, and this is um, a pretty interesting uh, uh, self-built house by a man named um, Sam Goldman. Uh, he's since deceased, but uh, he was a painter and decorator. Uh, and he lived in this cottage and raised uh, a number of children in this cottage with his wife. She ran a small dairy business on the property um, they had a cow and she sold raw milk and homemade cheese and butter. Uh, and this house is still owned by their, uh, their youngest son, Leo Goldman, uh, who is now uh, close to 90, um, but still shows up for the, uh, the Stilton Modern School reunions that are still held every year, uh, although unfortunately with dwindling numbers of attendees. Um, Leo is a great guy to talk to, and um, as I recount in the book, he told me his middle name is October because it was supposed to be October Revolution, but they wouldn't let his mother put that on the birth certificate, so it's just October. So it's quite a... Uh, it's a jump of about 30 years and uh, a huge jump in scale uh, and kind of modus operandi to go from Stelton to Greenbelt. Uh, Greenbelt is actually pretty close to where I live. Uh, and actually, I'm sure a number of the people in the room have been there um, and are familiar with it. So Greenbelt was built as a demonstration town um, during the New Deal. In the mid-1930s, the Resettlement Administration, which no longer exists, 
uh, was uh, this was an administration, an agency FDR created to deal with uh, you know problems of rural poverty and land, but also problems of uh, kind of urban land related problems. Um, and this administration was concerned about overcrowding in cities. There was a national housing shortage, uh, kind of similar to the situation today. Um, you know, people were kind of, families were often crammed into kind of two or three room apartments. Um, there was uh, a sense that there just, there weren't enough houses and that uh, cities were kind of too full and that, uh, you know, you needed to find a way to, uh, a, a rational way to expand outward. So, you know, these government officials looked longingly at the social housing that was being built in countries like Germany and the UK. And they really felt, and you can see this from some of the brochures they produced in the agency, they, they felt that America was lagging behind. They kind of said, these are the examples, you know, this is where we need to be and we're not there yet. Um, so they, they wanted to build modern green new rental communities, you know, for people uh, working and lower middle class people, I would say, on the outskirts of cities. And so with the, you know, the New Deal, uh, you know, they had, they had an opening to do this. They've been wanting to do this for quite a while and, and money, crucially. Um, so initially they wanted to build dozens of uh, these kind of so-called green belt towns around the country then that got whittled down to four, and then down to three. And of the three built, I think Green, green, belt, uh, green belt is the largest and best realized of them. Um, and you know, the, the planning and architecture were very state of the art for the time. Um, this was not a community of single family homes. Uh, this was a community of, of townhouses, uh, townhouse rows. And these kind of mid-rise apartment buildings that look, you know, very, very strikingly modernist in their design. Um, I, I think the idea was it was just more efficient to build that way instead of, you know, having everybody on their own lot in their own detached dwelling. Interestingly, uh, they also when they surveyed potential uh, future residents, they had a they expressed a preference for attached housing over detached housing. I don't know if that's because most of them lived in Washington and that's just what they knew. Um, but I think it's very interesting when people assume that everybody automatically you know, has an innate preference for a single family home. I, I think that's very much shaped by, by culture and by expectations. But so um, you know, within Greenbelt, the idea was that you would still though get that feeling, that sense of open space, proximity to nature because the housing you know, was all arranged around these, these central, these green courts with grass and trees and footpaths that crisscross them. And you could take the footpath and walk to the progressive federally run uh, elementary school or to the little downtown area, which had a movie theater, uh, a cooperative grocery store. Both of those are still there. Um, and, uh, and some other services uh, down there. So it was, somewhat walkable as well. I mean, it was not just a bedroom community where once you were home, you couldn't go anywhere or do anything. Um, and the idea was that these social courts would uh, help people make connections with their neighbors and, uh, and really help them form these community bonds. And by all accounts, that, that was quite successful, at least certainly in the uh, first couple of decades of Greenbelt's life when a lot of people had kids. And so they were all out in the courts with the kids getting to know their neighbors. Um, and you know, I think it's important to point out that Greenbelt, um, Greenbelt was, uh, it was all, a, it was an entirely rental community. So uh, there was a lot of interest in living there and it was competitive because it was a model town uh, built to, you know, built with modern conveniences at that time. Uh, like a, a rationally designed kitchen, you know, with some appliances, that was a big deal. Um, not everybody had that in the 1930s. So there was a waiting list to get in. Um, they selected tenants and um, it was, but there was also a, a maximum income that you could make to be considered. The idea was this was not for, you know, for, for people who were comfortably off, people who were affluent. This was for people who did not make that much money. 
Um, so it was essentially public housing. This was social housing or public housing built to a very high standard uh, with uh, you know, quite avant-garde architecture. Uh, and it was a, a point of pride for the government. And it's, it's quite hard to wrap your head around that concept and kind of square that with suburbia today. Um, so for me, uh, Greenbelt kind of raises this tantalizing question of you know, what if the, the government planners had had their way and this model that they had established had really taken off or you know, had become um, more widespread in the United States. And um, there were a lot of forces working against that. It was an incredibly controversial project, actually. Um, but uh, you know, it's just interesting to speculate, could we ever have had um, social housing, uh, you know, kind of garden cities on the outskirts of large cities the way they do in a lot of Europe? Um, this is the man behind Greenbelt, uh, Rexford Tugwell. Um, he was uh, quite a, a prominent politician in his day. Here he is on the cover of Time magazine. And I put him here because um, he was both what got Greenbelt built and probably what landed it in such controversy. Um, he was a real lightning rod. Uh, as you can see, he was quite a, quite a handsome uh, guy. Um, he was a, a pretty suave uh, Columbia University economist. He was a member of FDR's Brain Trust. Um, he was the one who really had the kind of vision and drive to see Greenbelt built. But um, he was uh, an incredibly controversial and hated figure among conservatives. Um, he was known as Rex the Red. Uh, because of his interest in collectivist agriculture in the Soviet Union, uh, which he was often attacked for. Um, the real estate and home building industries hated him. They hated Greenbelt. Uh, they complained that this was the government impinging on their private enterprise. Housing had to be left to the private sector. This was uh, unfair and un-American for, for the government to wade into it. So after having done so much to get Greenbelt built, um, before it even opened, uh, Tugwell was, uh, was forced to resign. Uh, he had become too much of a political liability. But interestingly, later in his life, he did move back, move to Greenbelt. He actually lived there uh, for a period, I, I think, when he was in his 60s or 70s, um, clearly feeling that this town was kind of his, his baby. Um, and, and, you know, the other kind of thing about Greenbelt that, you know, is that problematizes this story more is that um, I think partly because they were uh, expecting uh, such a degree of criticism, the officials in charge of Greenbelt uh, really wanted to position it as a sort of all-American, nuclear family-focused uh, community. You can actually kind of see that. And you know, a lot of the photos are, uh, <laughs> show the community with these small groups of, uh, of, of invariably white people chatting away in a kind of companionable manner. Um, it all looks very, very wholesome. There are often a lot of young, you know, cute children in the photos. Uh, the idea was to reassure people that, don't worry, this isn't too weird, right? Um, this is your tax dollars making a really nice all-American place. Uh, but, you know, part of that was, as was so often with New Deal progressive policies, um, Part of that was white supremacy. So um, yeah, there was a whites only policy for the rentals. Um, there were no black people allowed, uh, no non-white people allowed um, as Greenbelt renters, um, I think until, um, probably until you know, the fair housing era. Um, and uh, you know, at the time they kind of said, well, you know, Prince, it's Prince George's County, it's very rural. We could never have an integrated we just, it would just never fly. But you know, that was a convenient excuse. Um, so it's sort of an example of how uh, you know, a social experiment can be very progressive in some ways and, uh, and very not in others. So let's see, how are we doing for time? Let's see, I actually might. 
I might actually, well, I'll just quickly say um, another of the case studies in the book is of these two subdivisions outside of Boston built by, built in the 1940s and early 50s by a group of left-wing architects called the Architects Collaborative. You can see them there uh, standing on the stairs. Um, the most famous member of the Architects Collaborative, Collaborative was Walter Gropius, um, uh, an incredibly famous and influential uh, mid-century uh, architect, um, modernist architect. Uh, but um, it was supposed to be a non-hierarchical firm. The idea was that, you know, as the name suggested, everybody was an equal partner, uh, and they all worked together. And uh, you know, the emphasis was on collaboration rather than you know works of, of singular genius. Um, and as you can see, uh, this collaborative of its eight members included two women architects, which was very unusual at the time. Sadly, it would still probably be kind of unusual. I hate to say it, um, but uh, yeah. So Sally Harkness and Jean Fletcher, standing in the foreground there, uh, were parts of the collaborative, and um, you know they certainly had you know ideas about how to design a better neighborhood um, that uh, was sort of a suburban single-family home neighborhood, but had a lot of common spaces that facilitated uh, you know, commun good community relations, um, and that gave people a support network outside of the nuclear family, so people weren't kind of isolated and atomized in their little suburban houses. Um, and they really wanted to bring modernist architecture to the suburban masses, so they designed these really kind of wonderful houses, and they took, they you know, experimented with all sorts of design touches. They, um, they put in garage-style doors between their living rooms and patios sometimes. They used um, plexiglass, which was this brand new material that had been used in um, the noses of bombers during the Second World War. So they took plexiglass and made skylights out of that, these kind of bubble skylights. So they did all sorts of really cool architectural things. Um, and, uh, you know, and they did this at a fairly low cost, too, the idea being that this was a neighborhood that you know, people who were not wealthy could afford to live in. And it, you know, they had great success with that. It's, it's a wonderful, um, uh, these are, both of these subdivisions are wonderful. The ironic result is they did such a good job that the homes are now worth more than a million dollars. So <laughs> it's um, sort of you know, victims of their own success in that. Um, my fifth case study is um, a subdivision outside of Philadelphia, uh, kind of the north, just northeast of Philadelphia uh, in uh, Bucks County called Concord Park. Um, it's a very kind of plain Jane looking uh, Levittown-esque community of about 140 houses. Um, it, you know, the cookie cutter suburb to a T, right? Just kind of very ordinary little ranch houses um, you know, designed on kind of you know, curving streets. Um, but it had this one very different thing about it, which was that it was racially integrated. Um, you know, in, this was in the very early 1950s, and this was uh, deliberate. It was um, built as a demonstration to prove that integrated neighborhoods could work and that um, you know, the Levitts, who did not allow uh, black people to you know, initially to move into Levittown, um, that you know, it was supposed to be a kind of in your face to the Levitts, right? Because Levitt, Levittown, Pennsylvania was just up the road. So this was really a rebuke to racist housing policies. Um, and you can see here that uh, the, the subdivision got it, you know, there was a lot of PR around it because the whole point was to publicize it. Uh, and it got a lot of press. I think these two photos here are from Ebony Magazine, which was one of many publications that, you know, where the reporters visited, talked to the residents, and kind of reported that, you know, this very unusual, <laughs> you know, experiment in black, black and white suburbanites living side by side seems to be going pretty well. So, um, you know, they had social clubs, you know, a babysitting clubs, sewing clubs, um, 
cookouts. They had all the sort of 1950s social stuff that another suburb would have. The only difference was um, it was uh, black and white people involved. And so the person who was sort of the driving force here was uh, this very unusual builder named Morris Milgram who um, had grown up in socialist circles in New York and had uh, actually, I think he met his wife campaigning for Norman Thomas as president. Um, and, uh, but sort of, I think, uh, and was also um, very involved um, with the, uh, the Workers' Defense League as well. He was a very close friend of Pauli Murray uh, through his entire life, uh, actually. Um, uh, was very inspired by Pauli Murray and claims, actually, or claimed that uh, a lot of his drive to build this integrated housing came from uh, his relationship with Pauli Murray. So uh, that's kind of an interesting historical footnote. But um, he got into home building kind of by accident because his wife, the one he had uh, met in socialist politics, um, her father was a home builder. And uh, he really wanted to bring his son-in-law into the family business as he got older. And uh, you know, according to Milgram, he said, OK, I'll do it. You can teach me the tools of the tra you know, trade. You, know, you can teach me the business. But I'm going to build for whoever I want to build for once my sort of apprenticeship is over. And his father-in-law agreed. So um, Concord Park was, I think, his first, uh, the first community that, that he built. Um, and it was quite stressful for him. He was so worried that, uh, about striking the right racial balance. And this was not just him, but um, he had a sort of uh, a whole kind of board. Uh, you know, you know, there was an entity that built Concord Park. And there was a board that was, uh, you know, included a number of um, prominent black leaders. But they were all worried that you know, if there were too many black people, all the white people would run away. Um, so they instituted a quota, and they got very, uh, it caused them a lot of angst. How are we going to meet our quota? And what is the right quota? And they, they, they decided it would be 55% white, white and 45% black. And uh, apparently Milgram had uh, a plan of the site in his office where he stuck little pins in each house as it sold to indicate you know, the race of the um, the race of the buyers, so that he would meet that right quota. The idea was that if um, the worry was and, uh, that if there were um, not enough white people, that whites would not be comfortable and would, you know, immediately sell up or run away. Um, so, you know, it's it's a very. Um, I mean, wh when I think about it, it's uncomfortable to think about <laughs> um, uh, that. You know. Uh, and, and I guess all of the people involved were un uncomfortable, but decided that it was uh, uh, the only way, I guess, in a racist housing market uh, that they had to sort of institute their own very, very much less than ideal kind of um, uh, you know, policy. So, but Concord Park is, uh, is still there. No more quotas, <laughs> obviously. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite a, a diverse kind of, you know, solidly middle class uh, suburb of Philadelphia now. And um, I don't have a photo of her, but one of the people I enjoyed, another person I really enjoyed meeting uh, was a, a woman named Joyce Hadley, who has lived there almost her entire life uh, and is sort of a, a repository of a lot of community history. Uh, her parents were... Um, were African American and uh, had you know moved there when she was about six or seven, um, and uh, she has a lot of great great stories uh, about about the community then. But um, she is also very involved in uh, social justice work in Bucks County. So um, you know I think partly as a result of you know she says of you know having grown up where she did. So the last place I talk about is Reston, Virginia, which um, I won't dwell on because I feel like I've already, already a little bit up against time here. But um, Reston, people go there now, and I think it's, you know, a very much a um, Dulles Tech corridor, uh, you know, upper middle class, 
um, somewhat kind of urbanized, somewhat new urbanist suburb. But its early history is really fascinating. It was uh, founded in the mid 60s by uh, Robert Simon, who was a uh, developer from New York. He had been born into a real estate family. Um, and uh, I don't think he had a lot of experience with real estate, but um, he had traveled around Europe a lot, including on a bicycle, and had decided that sort of uh, Italian hill towns were the pinnacle of, of living, right? The, the pinnacle of urban, urban design and urban life. And he got this idea to try to build a suburb that was like the anti-suburb, that was more like an, Ital an Italian hill town where you, know, you could walk and uh, bump into your neighbors uh, after leaving the house on the way to buy a, a, a pint of milk, um, and that it would, have, uh, it would have elevating architecture and culture. Um, and so the original phase of Reston by Lake Anne, which is a man-made lake, has this kind of incredible brutalist, brutalist Gothic architecture. I'm not sure exactly how to describe it. That kind of tried to approximate some of that feel of an Italian hill town in a brutalist language in the 1960s in Virginia. So, um, but you know, another thing about Reston was it was integrated as well from the start, and quite a lot of African Americans moved there because um, there, you know, it was so hard to get a mortgage or to buy a house in any suburbs around D.C. at that time, including in Maryland, not just in Virginia, but certainly in Virginia. Uh, where, you know, the, um, gosh, I mean, it, it was even before the Loving case. So, I mean, it was, um, it, it was a, a seen as a, quite a bold move at the time. Um, but uh, Reston now, I think, epitomizes a lot of the struggles that um, uh, suburbs are having because um, they were sort of ahead of the curve on a lot of things. They built out, you know, after doing this, they, in the 90s, built out their town, town center that's kind of a new urbanist downtown area. It's, it's not huge. It's only about eight square blocks, but, um, you, know, it's, uh, it has, you know, it has real density. It has uh, real public amenities. And now they have the silver line of the metro, and um, the population has grown a lot. And uh, there are proposals to raise the density cap and to uh, build quite intensely urban nodes around the new metro stations. And it's very interesting because some people are all for this and other people, um, you know, Reston is not immune to the sort of NIMBY movement at all. And other people are saying, no way, this is a suburb and we are going to stay a suburb, which is uh, kind of mind bending because this is a suburb that had a a 16-story building like a couple of years after it was built. Um, so there's really, uh, uh, it sort of embraced urbanity from the beginning, but a lot of people still do feel very strongly that it should not be urban, that it needs to be more suburban, uh, uh, you know, in, in character. So I think, you know, as suburbs kind of grapple with what their next identity is going to be, what the next phase of uh, you know, in their kind of life cycle is going to be, I think, kind of some of the, uh, you know, existential <laughs> problems that Reston has right now, I think, are going to become more common. Um, so I have some thoughts on how to remedy that. But so, I mean, just, you know, having done the research for the book and kind of trying to draw some lessons, uh, you know, I think it's so inspiring to see there is this kind of alternative tradition of suburbs that were not all dominated by single family homes on big lots, that were not all um, places where you had to drive everywhere. Um, and you know, you just, you have to let apartments and accessory dwellings and duplexes and triplexes into the suburbs. Um, it's, it's good on, in, on so many counts, I probably won't bore you by enumerating them. You might already be familiar with the arguments, but um, yeah, uh, you know, the kind of single family suburban zoning has got to go. Um, you know, one thing that I loved about the anarchist colony in New Jersey is so many people lived in 
Outsiders derisively called them the Stilton Shack. Actually, I think some people in the colony jokingly called them the Stilton Shack, too. But you can see here, this is a photo of a, a child um, playing the violin in front of one of the early cottages. People did upgrade them over time as they had the ability and the, um, you know, the money. But they were pretty basic. Uh, sometimes people would be kind of horrified when they came from the outside, but they were very small, often two or three rooms. So really, I mean, the anarchist colony was kind of the original tiny house village, you know? And, uh, you know, people made do with that quite well. I mean, it was a real way that, you know, the people who settled Stelton from New York, most of them were immigrants uh, who had come quite recently from Eastern Europe or Russia. Some of them didn't speak very good English. Um, they did not, you know, have jobs. Uh, they did not have a lot of money, which is why they commuted such a long way back to New York. They weren't, you know, middle class people playing at Utopia. Um, they, you know, they, they, needed, they needed to work to earn a living. This was a way for them to earn, to, to actually own property and to build, uh, to build some, some wealth. And so, you know, as they added onto their homes over time, um, that became a, a wonderful family asset for them. So um, that's, uh, you know, I don't know. It just, it certainly, it, as you can see, having, you know, more kind of levels of entry onto, you know, that ladder uh, could help a lot of people, I think. As I said earlier, um, yeah, you know, there were suburbs certainly in the past that were more walkable. Um, you know, not just the kind of streetcar suburbs that you might have, uh, you might be familiar with, but um, you know, even suburbs uh, built after that. I think Greenbelt's a good example. It's, um, you know, certainly could be more walkable. It's very unfortunate that historic Greenbelt is not connected to the metro. I mean, they're a few miles apart, and that's a, a big problem. Um, but if you do live in Greenbelt, there are certainly a number of day-to-day -day, uh, you know, things that you can do on foot, um, you know, going to the grocery store, getting a haircut, going out to lunch. Um, and you know, that it, it makes a huge difference, especially, I think, for people uh, who are older um, to be able to do things you know, where you don't need a car. Maybe by the time you hit a certain age, you can't drive anymore. I think it's, um, it's a sort of resilient strategy for people who are aging in place. This here is actually, this is Reston, which if you know it, has this kind of J-shaped plaza at Lake Ann that has a bunch of stores and then apartments overlooking it right by the lake. So prioritizing renters, co-ops, and subsidized housing. I think it was so refreshing to you know, learn about all of these examples of places where you know, home ownership was you know, not the be all and end all. And um, you know, Greenbelt is a great example. example. However, you know, uh, outrageously uh, racially exclusive it was um, for the white people who were allowed to live there. Um, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a wonderful thing. I mean, there are still, uh, you know, families, um, families of people who live in Greenbelt who, you know, first came in, you know, as, as tenants of the original government housing. Um, but, you know, people just raved about it. It was, um, uh, they couldn't believe they were so lucky to live in these 800 square foot townhouses, <laughs> um, which now we would be like, you know, what, that's tiny. But, um, uh, at, you know, at the time, they were very, very satisfied with it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the photo of the kind of wooden houses over here is from Economy in Pennsylvania. And of course, they were not uh, homeowners either. They had all entered into this agreement. They were uh, owners, uh, they were all members of the society that collectively owned the houses. Um, and, you know, again, um, hundreds of people um, made it work very well in that situation. So I really think that, um, I think it would be great if uh, people who are interested in um, different forms of, of living <laughs> and different forms of, um, of ownership, uh, you know, maybe took another look at the suburbs. I'm sure there are people who think that, I don't know, maybe the suburbs is not, uh, not the right setting for that, but there is this tradition. 
And I think that if suburbs were smart, they would encourage it and maybe even incentivize it, you know, with, with seed money for, um, you know, for community land trusts and things like that. So transit was often um, the kind of a make or break thing in the communities I studied. I talked before about how um, the Pennsylvania Railroad was really this lifeline for the anarchist uh, suburb and that they were constantly going back and forth to New York or you know, getting new kids for the school in on the train. Um, and people would sometimes just come for the weekend or the summer and they were an important part of the community. But you know, um, this is, so this is actually a, a journalist would come and kind of snoop around the suburb, like the, the anarchist suburb, like what is this place? So this was a, um, a, a newspaper story from I think it was 1919, uh, observing that the, uh, the anarchists, uh, that they commute and um, that they look fairly inconspicuous on the train, but maybe not up to the sartorial standard of your regular suburban commuter. But, um, and if you compare that with the other photo here, uh, this is some men in Greenbelt carpooling, you know, back when uh, Greenbelt was first founded. Um, often, you know, a number of people had cars in the early 40s, but, um, you know, it would be one car per family or maybe not even that. So people carpooled to work in Washington. Um, but you know, with Greenbelt, they had tried some type of bus service, but you know, it had, Greenbelt at that time had about maybe 1,200 or 1,300 people. It just wasn't enough to really sustain a bus line. So that closed down. Reston, I think, had a similar experience when it first got going. So, um, you know, and both of those places are pretty car dependent now. So, uh, you know, it's, the transit piece is really important and, um, uh, I, I'm a big proponent of suburban transit and, uh, you know, light rail, bus rapid transit, and subway extensions, all really good and important. Um, productive land, land that is not just ornamental and, um, and, and manicured to look pretty, but land that works uh, was a feature of a number of these communities. Um, uh, this photo here is Stelton, that's some of the kids with the, um, the head of the school. And you can see a cow behind them and some crops in the fields. Um, and then the other photo is of um, some green belters uh, tending their victory garden. So there, there were, were kind of um, a garden, you know, garden plots at, uh, at Greenbelt originally. So, um, you know, a lot of these suburbs, but also other ones I don't even talk about much in the book, um, it was very normal, you know, to keep, um, maybe to keep chickens uh, or even a pig or, um, you know, to certainly grow vegetables uh, on your land. And I think it's very um, heartening that that is sort of starting to come back, that, you know, some of these kind of anti-chicken ordinances have been lifted now. And um, you know, there was just a story the other day about um, a couple that had been, I'm not sure where they were, maybe in Florida, but they had been fighting their local town that had some ordinance saying they couldn't plant vegetables in their yard. And they had won this multi-year legal battle um, to be able to have this ordinance struck down and to be able to actually plant vegetables on their own land. So I think you know, there are a lot of those kind of dumb regulations that just need need to fall. And you know, another productive use for uh, suburban land does not have to be agricultural. Um, in terms of stormwater management, you know, that is going to be a hugely, hugely uh, important thing uh, you know, as climate change commences. And um, you know, just better using, better using the land um, to absorb water um, and using native plants and um, uh, plants that aren't so thirsty. Uh, is going to be really important too. Well, some of you who know me know I'm often ragging on architects for being too focused on cities and not really thinking about um, the huge challenge ahead of you know repurposing a lot of obsolete suburban infrastructure. <laughs> um, and uh, some architects are thinking about it, thankfully, but I think more should, and I think. Um, you know, what would be a better thing for architects to get on board with than this enormous climate challenge, essentially? 
Um, and I, I really hope that, I think that architects can also you know, have that creative ability to think through um, some problems and find really creative solutions that um, non-designers you know, wouldn't be able to. Um, and you know, finally, it's very, been very interesting to me, you know, living in Montgomery County, I think among the many assumptions that people have about suburbia, you know, in addition to the whole like, it's boring, you know, it'll never change, it's just the, it's the way it is, the way it is is always going to be the way it's going to be. Um, I think one of those assumptions people have is that sort of maybe suburbia is where people go to escape like, like political conflict or dissent or discourse and you know, suburbia is just where you settle. But it's just, I just wanted to end on a sort of reminder that suburban space is contested space too. So in Montgomery County where I live, there are a number of controversial, controversial issues at play right now. One of them is loosening the rules about building accessory dwelling units, which has a lot of supporters, but a lot of opponents. So this over here is um, some, uh, a protest, a, a small one, uh, but people who really are, really are afraid that um, accessory dwelling units will hurt their property values um, and, uh, and make traffic and parking worse. And so there have been a number of these, pro these protests just in recent weeks. And then the other photo uh, illustrates a kind of parallel uh, uh, point of contention in the county, which is over school boundaries. Uh, Montgomery County is a huge county with um, more than 100,000 kids in the school system. And um, it's a very diverse county as well, but there's a lot of e internal segregation within the school system. So certain schools uh, are uh, you know, quite affluent and quite white, and um, those are often in a very high-end, high uh, you know, very wealthy neighborhoods, and then other schools um, you know, have a majority of kids who get a uh, free and reduced lunch and are, are not nearly so advantaged. And uh, there's a pretty, pretty stark internal divide. So this photo actually shows um, uh, some kids and talking to a man who I think, I assume is a parent at a, a meeting about redrawing the school boundaries, which is a process that's about to get underway, I think. And um, according to a report in the press, it wasn't clear what they, exactly they were talking about, except that the kids and the adult strongly disagreed. So I think you can, I can leave it to your imagination, you know, who was maybe in favor of redrawing the boundaries and who wasn't. Um, but this movement to rethink the boundaries for the sake of equity is actually, there's a, really being student driven, there's a group called Montgomery County Students for Change uh, that actually has kids in schools all over the county. It's, um, it's, it's quite an inspiring thing. Uh, and they're really, um, uh, you know, becoming strong activists for um, thinking about educational equity um, in a really uh, active and proactive and robust way. So that kind of gives me hope for, um, you know, I think the commitment and drive are there to remake the suburbs uh, you know, maybe on a different model, perhaps drawing on lessons from some of the communities I talked about today. So I think, you know, how the suburbs of the future will look is not predetermined. It's very much an open question. And um, I hope, I'm excited to see what, uh, what some of the next phases of suburbia are. So thank you. So I don't need time for a book signing, informal discussion, having a drink afterwards, all those kinds of things. So um, any any questions? With the indigenous history? That's a really good question. I I mean, I think it was pretty much all settler. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that any of them really engaged um, with indigenous history, no. And I, 
I will admit it's a short book, and I did not myself um, really probe the indigenous history of the lands, but. There, sorry. Oh, police infrastructure. Well, you know, it's interesting. They all have different forms of governance. So like, um, and they're, they're really disparate in size. So some of them are just subdivisions of a few hundred people. And some of them, like Reston has almost 60,000 people. So that was kind of one of the challenges is try, you know, you know, some of them I could talk about in much more detail because they were smaller than others. But um, Greenbelt is now like an incorporated place, uh, an incorporated city in Maryland. Um, and the historic part of it is only a small part of it. It has about 28,000 people now. So it has, I think I know it has a mayor and council. Um, I guess it would have probably PG County police. Um, and then, yeah, I'm not sure like how the policing, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think a lot of that would probably be at the county level for most of these places, yeah. Uh, hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you linked with the slide about how suburbs uh, kind of have like an open question. Mm -hmm. look. I guess, do you see in the future the possibility for alternative models of ownership like you saw in Greenbelt, given the uh, restrictions that we now have with zoning or like, I associate real estate developers as having a lot more money and a lot more power and influence than they previously had. So do you think those types of alternative models of ownership are possible in Canada? Yeah, I think they're possible. I mean, you, as you just pointed out, there are a lot of barriers. And uh, so I wouldn't say I'm like super optimistic that they're going to take off, uh, certainly not without a lot of effort. I mean, I think that uh, in jurisdictions where there are, you know, smart and progressive suburban leaders, I think that it's important for them to try to um, remove some of those barriers and make it more of an even playing field between private development and, you know, kind of alternative forms of community and ownership. Um, you know, some of those, you know, some of the financing barriers, I think, are, uh, you know, some of that just is to do with, you know, with banks and kind of, I think that's kind of a larger, maybe not such a localized question, but, but certainly, um, you know, you could, if you were a, a county, uh, a county government, you could have a member of staff who was sort of the point person for anybody who wanted to create, um, uh, you know, to establish a, a community land trust and help connect them with grants and maybe offer them some county money or something like that. I think, um, there needs to be more proactive efforts like that. Uh, I think that is a really good way to help achieve some longer term, um, you know, socioeconomic kind of uh, integration uh, and affordable, longer term affordable housing in suburbs. Yeah. Two more questions. Um, okay. <laughs> um, two lovely brief questions. First is, I think. It's, <laughs> I think it's easy. It's easier for me to understand why homogenized communities, like along ideology or identity, are were successful. But looking like the rest of the model, like were there any insights that you gained from there about why they were able to to thrive and have that community um, with their diversity? Um, the second one is, uh, mo like, if you were to recommend visiting a few suburbs that are really challenging the status quo in 2019, what would they be? <laughs> Those are both good questions. The first one, yeah, I, I sort of. I discussed that a little bit in the book. It is really, um, you can definitely see like with the religious commune, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania, those were people who were fervently religious and, you know, they were devoting their lives to the shared faith that they had. So that's a pretty clear uh, kind of form of social glue in a community. But um, I think it was a little bit different in each place. Like in the anarchist suburb, for instance, they were actually not all anarchists, um, and they were a different strain of anarchists too. So there were kind of more individualistic anarchists, more collectivist anarchists. Um, there were uh, socialists. There were, um, you know, after the Russian Revolution, there were uh, communists, and they would fight with the old school anarchists. I mean, people were actually fighting all the time, but the school was sort of the constant thing that everybody agreed. The school was important. 
that they wanted, did not want a sort of, you know, conventional state education for their kids. So the school became the sort of locus. Um, and, you know, in Reston and some of these other places, um, I think it, the bond is not quite as strong, but um, maybe that's okay because places have to evolve and change over time. It certainly seemed like, um, I think in a lot of these places, though, the sense that they were like doing something new, that they were experimenters and that they were kind of pioneers, uh, that definitely united people, the first generation of people at least. And sometimes I think the second generation too, the sense that we're doing something new and different out here. Nobody's quite sure how this is going to go, but we're, you know, kind of, um, you know, we're going to try it out. I think people became very excited, excited about that. And it really, it really marked their lives. Like looking back at it in old age, it was like a really important part of their lives. So, you know. Oh, and your second one about radical suburbs now. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could have devoted, I wish there were enough to fill like a whole, um, you know, uh, conclusion of the book or last chapter. Um, trying to think now, like, there are a lot of little pockets, probably. Um, I did talk about, I, I talk about places in the book that have, you know, unusual design or, um, uh, you know, are kind of pushing the envelope in terms of how they're set up. But in terms of a truly radical suburb now, I don't know. I'm interested if anyone in the audience has any suggestions on. El Sanito, Texas, the Colonia south of Laredo. Okay. It's informal, largely uh -huh. informal housing. They, they, they're incorporated as a town or city. And when Texas was considering passing an English only law, El Sanito passed the Spanish only law. Oh, that's really so cool. All, okay. All yeah. business with the municipality had to be done in Spanish. That's fascinating. I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, I think. I'm looking at it better than I can write up. Just real quick. The trend that I've been following is like these uh, like developments that are kind of like very dense. So like making the suburb that we create an urban lifestyle experience. Right. And Well, I talk about it a little bit um, in terms of Reston, because that's definitely the case in Reston. Um, I think, I mean, my personal idea, thoughts about it are, um, I think that's what we're going to see in a lot of malls, <laughs> especially, uh, and sometimes strip malls in the next 20 or 30 years, um, at least in places with a good local economy to support it. Um, I think a lot of malls are going to be redeveloped in that way because it's one of the few places in a suburb where you just get one big parcel of land, right? And you can just kind of do this kind of master planned mixed use thing on it. Um, I think, you know, I think those, those developments, it's easy to kind of, you know, you, they look, once you've seen one, you've seen a bunch, right? I mean, they're, they're usually, uh, you know, they're, they're their own kind of cookie cutter design in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people, I think, um, th they're not winning any design awards and people kind of complain about them being very, looking like they're, you know, a city from a box, right? Just right out of a box. But I think they're important in terms of building up enough density that hopefully if they can, you know, change some street patterns, maybe build some blocks into the local area, you know, like real, real, you know, real street systems instead of, you know, the big suburban feeder roads and service roads and all that, you can actually get to a neighborhood where people can walk and maybe take transit if it's near transit uh, and live in an apartment instead of, you know, in a big single family home maybe they don't want. So I, I think that's important, um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, from an environmental perspective. Um, but I think it's equally important to, you know, to, inc to have that kind of slightly smaller scale, what they call kind of missing middle housing of, you know, just building like building a triplex on your average lot instead of one big house, you know, I think that's just as important and, um, you know, maybe maybe not quite so visible. Well, it hasn't been happening that much yet, but this whole new wave of legislation recently means that it will, at least in uh, in Minneapolis and in Oregon now. So, you know. Well, thank it. you so much for this. Thank you so much for coming, everyone.